If you had to summarize what your experience has been in representing athletes and managing athletes, what has been your experience in managing and representing athletes? What is it about? I, I find that there's a lot of power and vulnerability and humility. And so I'll start out with a pretty humbling story about representing athletes. So when I first started my practice for about the first, I guess, five years, uh, I represented probably hundreds of athletes, not nobody really of, of, of sort of high note, but I was definitely involved in the space. And I think after that five years, I made a total of $500. And that $500 was from representing a race car driver who got a speeding ticket. And so I had to go to court to represent the, uh, the driver. So my point is, is that representing athletes in my sort of experience has been, you know, it's sort of, it's all about who, you know, it's all about that first client. So I think at the end of the day, everybody wants to be the next Jerry Maguire, but uh, it's all about relationships. It's all about um, sort of where the doors are opening. I guess the, the silver lining is that there's a place for everybody, right? It might not be as a player agent, uh, but there's, you know, as, as sort of you heard Bob's background, you know, as a general counsel, Darren's made a great career. Uh, Phil and Harold all have great careers. And, um, and, and, you know, it can really kind of span the, the gambit of, of sort of uh, how to get involved in the space. I ended up in this business completely by happenstance. I uh, thought I would be a biochemist and that gravitated to a few other areas before I went to law school and interned for a firm. Um, that had a specialty practice in this area. And then a few years after that, a few of us started our own firm. And what I would say to all of you is that you should look at the, at the world as a glass that's 90% full, not 50% full. You're living at a time when there are more opportunities than ever. You know, 30, 40 years ago, athletes were not paid very well. Um, typically, they were represented only by lawyers. This is a group uh, on the panel that's kind of heavily weighted toward people with legal backgrounds. It's no longer necessary. It's not a bad skill to have. But being an agent these days means providing service to clients um, in a world that has unlimited opportunities. It's not only about negotiating a contract, it's about building brands, doing marketing and appearances and preserving their wealth and finding a transition for many of them to live a life afterwards. And I, I like to say that Sports is only a, a career really for athletes and coaches. For all of us here on this panel who are on the business side of sports, it's really just an application of another professional skill set. So the choice of the university you went to is very good because it's liberal arts. You will learn a lot to think horizontally and how to connect with different kinds of people in a diverse world. I think that's absolutely critical. And then follow your passion and apply the skills that you learn to helping others. I have done some work for uh, coaches and executives uh, and athletic administrators in the college ranks. Most of those have uh, involved uh, their termination. Uh, they're looking for help after they've been fired. And I've helped them work through the, their termination agreements. Uh, I guess I could take a, a line from my good friend, Stan Gaston, who is part owner and president of the uh, Los Angeles Dodgers, who gave a speech at the Sports Lawyers Association one year and said, I hate all agents. Uh, and I don't hate all agents. There are some good agents. There are some bad agents. Agents do what they have to do to represent their clients, just like uh, lawyers uh, do when they're representing their clients. And sometimes they have uh, an unpopular cause that they're defending or an unpopular client. I'm sure that agents are faced with that dilemma sometimes as well. But uh, in, in my career, having represented uh, teams in negotiations with player agents, uh, I've, I've always said that I prefer dealing with a player agent uh, as opposed to dealing with the player directly because uh, they're not as so – players are take it a little bit more personally than an agent does. So uh, I think an agent or a lawyer representing a player plays a very significant role in, in the whole dynamic of uh, sports representation. Anyway, I'm probably one of the few agents out there that got into this business by truly accident. I, I never wanted to be an agent. Uh, kind of growing up, I went to school at University of Tampa, Florida on a baseball scholarship, had a little short little break with the Mets out there uh, and realized that was not going to be where life was going to take me. Uh, came to St. Louis, uh, Missouri, didn't know much about it. 
uh, until I got there. A little different than growing up in New York and, and being in Florida. Through batting practice for the Cardinals in 1982 and part of 83. And uh, as Bob Wallace would remember, that's where the football Cardinals were practicing at that time and became good friends with quite a few of the guys. And uh, one of them got released from the team. He said, hey, you got a good gift to gab. Maybe you can help me out. And it was kind of like fake it till you make it. Helped him out. His name was Chris Combs. Um, and then it was Carl Allen, as Bob, you would remember those names. Uh, and then Stump Mitchell, one of our famous ones that we worked together on. Uh, and about three, four years into it, I probably had about eight, nine, 10 players in the NFL. And I said, you know, what? I'm kind of liking this. Maybe I need to charge these guys. I was never charging anybody anything. It was more of a relationship and a friendship. I said, but if we're going to do this, we're going to do it a little bit differently. Uh, and we're going to take a look at more of the personal side than just the business side. And I guess now after going on 37 years in this business, we've represented probably close to 500 players in the National Football League uh, and just had a lot of fun with it. But the key success in this, I think both Jeremy and, uh, uh, and, and many of the people on the panel understand what it is. It's a relationship. You know, what separates you from another agency out there? Everybody can do a contract. Some could do a little bit better by the structure of the deal, but it's the relationship that you build, uh, two relationships, one with that player, uh, where it's a true relationship, and the other one's with a team, uh, and a team where you have that trust, where you speak to these teams, it's not just a sales job, it's sincere, it's real. And if you have a player that is going down the wrong path, you as the agent, you can't be a tail you know, wagging a dog, uh, you have to be the dog wagging its own tail and put them in the right direction. That's what you're getting paid for. Not just a fiduciary responsibility, but a, a moral responsibility, ethical response, a everything you can do to help that young man take this job of playing professional sports and making a career in life and being a good citizen, a good father, a good husband. And, and that's really what your job as an agent is to do. It's a complete package. It's not just getting them a contract and saying goodbye and getting permission. So I'm a practicing lawyer. I've been practicing for 11 years, but actually going into law school, I started up my own agency from scratch. So this was back in 2007. And I did it for the three years that I was in law school. And then for one year thereafter, when I was practicing at my first uh, small law firm. And so one, I, I don't want to dissuade anybody from becoming a sports agent, but I'll give you a, I'll give you three reasons why I decided to pivot from being a sports agent to practicing as a lawyer full time. Number one, it's extremely expensive. You have to come out of pocket. If you don't have financial backing, it's going to be incredibly difficult to break in um, or unless you work with a larger agency. If let's say you work with baseball players, expect to pay for their, their equipment on the way up to the majors if they ever make it there and not be earning a commission during that time. If you're working with NFL players like Harold, Expect to be paying for players training, for their housing, for per diem, big expenses before they ever make it into the NFL. We're talking about tens to hundreds of thousands of dollars in upfront payments to players. So again, it's extremely expensive. And then you go to number two, there's low margins. So in Harold's world as an NFL agent, he is capped at making 3% on an NFL player's contract. Uh, there are often times that an agent will take less than 3% to be competitive with others. There are over 700 licensed NFL agents to work with roughly 1,700 NFL players. So, and think about the fact that the top 10, the agents with the top 10 most clients, they have, I think, roughly 400 to 500 of those players. So it's incredibly difficult to break in and you have very low margins and then the third reason that I decided to pivot, and there are many more, uh, would be the ruthless competition. You'll see, and it's not just the NFL, it's Major League Baseball, it's the NBA. The players are fickle and the competition between agents is ruthless. So you'll see players enter the league with a particular agent and then change agents throughout their careers. In fact, many players will change agents multiple times throughout their careers. And you're not, as an agent, guaranteed a commission unless you actually negotiate the player's contract. I won't get into uh, legal minutia and talk about promissory uh, or quantum merit uh, potential relief, but 
it's expensive, low margins, and ruthless competition. Again, not trying to dissuade anyone from breaking in. The best of the best will be successful. Um, and if you're absolutely passionate about it, I implore that you do your research and make the relationships and do your best to break in and, and have that drive because Harold, Phil, they're very successful in the sports agency world. So they're proof that there is possibility and potential if your heart is set on it. Phil, how do you, when you when your team is approaching an athlete, how, how do you sell them on Octagon when you've got all these other competitors? Obviously you've got great brand equity yourself personally and the company, but I'm just interested in how that pitch works when you try to pitch an athlete. Well, first, let, let me say that Darren's analysis was probably the best analysis that I have heard in 40 years of doing this. Um, and, and, and that's the optimistic view. <laughs> it gets tougher from there uh, for lots of reasons. But um, just to go back to the earlier question for one second, that's why it's really important for all of you to get a very broad education and be qualified in the skill. So Darren was able to pivot a lot of people who enter this business are, are just not able to do that. And being self-aware enough to know what one likes to do, what one does best, what one can earn a, a living at is critically important because you see a lot of people in the agent world who don't do that and they end up often on the wrong side of the moral street and the financial street uh, as well. And to answer the question from there, you know, the number one human trait, I think, in anyone who's providing a service to others is to understand your client and then try to explain to your client what you do and more importantly, how you do it, that will suit them. Because the agent or representative really means just that. It means that you're bringing something to the party for the benefit of the other party. It's not for one's own benefit. So our pitch is really very tailored to who the person is to whom we're talking. You have to know your audience. I mean, all of my colleagues here on these panels have faced situations where you walk into a, a living room or you're on a, a Zoom call now or whatever it is, and you have to figure out who the ultimate decision maker is because an athlete comes with coaches and parents and uh, others who may not have the same interest as that athlete. And sometimes the athlete isn't making a decision. If an athlete is making a decision, that athlete <laughs> may be persuaded of different decisions through forces that you know, he or she doesn't even expect at the time. So finding, be, being authentic to oneself, finding who the decision maker is on the other side, um, trying not to overpromise. I mean, you're trying to explain what you can do to be additive to a player's future career, but not in a way that makes it seem that you can control their destiny because none of us really can. And then ultimately, again, we have to decide whether somebody's interested in us because of Octagon as a whole is it because of players that we have represented over decades? Is it because of players we represent in other sports? Is it because of ancillary services beyond just a contract negotiation? Or are they interested just in the group within the sport they play? Or are they interested just in the individual agent or team of agents who may be talking to them either because they've been referred specifically by a friend of this potential client or otherwise? So the pitch is, is very, very different, but the consistency is that one should never waver from who one really is and explain the services that one can really deliver rather than something that one can't. You, you know, there's a, there's a lot of things that, that go into that. You gotta realize, number one, if you go into that living room, uh, there was about probably at least a dozen other butts sitting on that same couch right before you. And you could be sure of that. Uh, and they're trying to sell them on all about contracts and what they did for this player and what they did for that player. And that, that's all good and dandy, but when you're talking about a rookie player coming out of college, the contract's are already done for you. I can tell you exactly if I have Tyree Gillespie this year coming out of University of Missouri, whether he's a second or third round pick, uh, and he is number 17 in the third round, I can tell you exactly what his signing bonus is going to be in his contract. There's really no negotiating. Maybe a little bit of the structure and the verbiage in the contract. So really what you're selling is, number one, in, in all businesses, you're selling yourself first. Then you're selling the product of who you are and the need and why they need you. Uh, and as good as you could be as an agent and selling yourself, the best thing that I found out is they just met me. And there's not a trust there yet. Trust is something that you earn over a period of time. You tell them, listen, I'm gonna give you a listing. Of, you tell me when to stop countless players that went to your school, 
that you may know in the league that are no longer in the league that are coaching now GMs and give it to the parent and also parents of these players and do your work, call them up and see what they say. And if I don't get on a scale one to 10, at least a 9.5, don't call me back. And let them do a lot of the selling. A lot of times that really helps out a, a lot over there. But you got to also understand your audience. You got to understand what are they looking for. Sometimes you walk into some of these, these living rooms, and I hate to say it, they're looking for something from you. What are you going to pay? First thing they bring up, like Darren said, boy, he knows it all too well, training. I want my, my son to go to Exos. Well, is Exos the right place for your son? Well, I don't care. This is where I want him to go. Uh, we want a, a $50,000 advance. Well, what do you need the money for? None of your business. Then you know that's not the right player for you because you want to kind of work with them and show them that it's not how much money you make in this world, it's how much you save and to be smart about things. So you get a good feeling. And as much as you're trying to sell yourself to that player, you want to at that same time see if this is the right player for your organization. Uh, is there any off the field issues that you need to know about? And many of them do have off the field issues, but are they something that they're willing to work with you and change those? If they're not, it's the wrong guy. It's great to meet you. Good luck. Because there's only so many players you can represent, at least in my opinion, and do it properly. Uh, I know a lot of the bigger agencies can go in there and represent three, four, five quarterbacks in a draft, uh, four tight ends in that draft. Uh, I don't know how they do it. <laughs> and when I asked them, I said, how do you sell your player over these other ones? They always telling me that, well, we just let the team is going to do the picking anyway. So we represent them all. I feel that we need to Everybody else is the enemy. We need to sell our player and show what separates him from everybody else and really push. So uh, I think, you know, Phil, what we were talking about before, quality over quantity is so much more important these days. If you go on their turf and you're meeting that family and knowing that there was so many other people sitting on that same couch as you, telling the same basic stories as you, uh, it's always better if you can get them onto your turf. If you can get that player and his family after their last collegiate game, when it's illegal to get them out there and book them on that first flight and, and get them to your home and sit with your family to see you're a family person and meet their family, all the decision makers in there and not spend a two hours, but spend a day or two, nine out of 10 times you will sign that player. He becomes part of your family and it becomes a relationship that you're starting to build right there and then. And, and you may tell him some things he doesn't want to hear, but again, Phil, you hit on the head. Your job out there is to direct them, put them in the right path for life. Hey, Harold, yeah. if, you, if you can get a player on an airplane, you know that the player is interested in you already. So you've, you've won half the battle. So kudos <laughs> to you for being able to do that often. But again, all you need is four, five, six good players each year in the draft. Focus on those players. Hold them into the second contract. And, that, and that's where you make your money is in those second contracts. That 3% on a, you know, let's just say a guy's a fourth round pick over here. You're barely going to cover training for that first year. And then you start making some money. But if you get the right player and you hold on to them and you, you can avoid the Rosen houses of the world to try to steal your players, which happens every year, then you can hit this. We just hit a, a home run with uh, Trey Hendrickson. He just got $60 million to go to the Cincinnati Bengals for, for four years, 32 million of it in the first two years. Uh, that's when you can say, okay, it's time to quit my day job. We're doing pretty good here. <laughs> well, it's, it's funny when you guys were talking about that and talking about getting the kid on a plane, I, I had a flashback to the last dance last year when they told the story about how Michael Jordan almost didn't sign with Nike, but his parents insisted that he go to Oregon, fly to Oregon, and, you know, the rest is history. Jeremy, tell us about your experiences. You know, you said that you work with people across different forms of the entertainment industry, what both entertainment in media and in sports. Do you see any differences in working with those different clients? Yeah, no, really good question. And, and it's funny because... Um, I've always been a big believer of sort of going where the doors are opening. And, you know, anytime that I sort of make a, a decision about going into an industry or, or trying to break into an industry, I really just look at three principles and I look at um, uh, geography, branding, and community. 
uh, geography all about, you know, sort of where the action is happening. Uh, for me, that's in LA. And uh, although I love San Diego and, and it's paradise down there, I knew I had to move to uh, Los Angeles to kind of break in. And, um, and of course, that opened up some opportunities for entertainment. And it's interesting, the agency side is very, very similar um, in terms of registration processes and things you have to go through. The difference is, is that where a lot of times with sports agents, uh, you end up doing a lot of the pitching. Um, although I love Harold's point about the fact of having them pitch to you as well, because I think that's important. At the end of the day, like you want to be able to pick your clients too, right? You don't want your clients just picking you and saying, I want to work with you. You might end up some, with some bad apples that way. Um, but with the talent side on in entertainment, what I find is, is that um, the agents are out there kind of picking the talent and it's very rare that uh, there's much pitching going on. It's mostly the agent saying, okay, this person's you know, worth the talent and we're gonna make a pitch to a studio. Um, but it is interesting because I think for the entertainment side, we're seeing uh, somewhat of a consolidation uh, of the industries in the sense that you're seeing a lot of former football players or sports stars becoming, uh, you know, broadcasters. Um, you're seeing, uh, you know, folks like Kevin Durant getting into podcasting. You're really seeing kind of this consolidation between entertainment, media, and sports. Uh, and particularly, you know, I think as Harold mentioned, as Phil mentioned, there's so many opportunities out there now with streaming and um, all the applications that are available, uh, we truly live in the golden age of content in that way. So I'd say deal making is pretty similar. Um, but again, I, anytime I'm trying to get into an industry, I would just impart on everybody here, the idea of sort of geography, branding, and community being where the action is doing the parts that you need to be doing to brand yourself, uh, whether that be writing or podcasting or being available, I think Darren is one of the best at that. And uh, Darren and I can't kind of came out of the same cut from the same cloth in that way, or out of the same school in that way. And we've been friends for probably over a decade now. And then um, the community aspect and, and Bob had talked about this earlier, joining organizations like the sports lawyers association uh, and other groups where you're not just joining to, you know, put it on your resume, but you're joining to get involved and to have an impact. And I've found that those sort of three things together can be really helpful. It kind of dovetails into when I was listening to everyone else speak, what I was going to uh, sort of go into. And, you know, everybody talked about the difficulty in getting clients and uh, as, as an agent. Uh, but this is a really tough sports and the sports business is a very tough profession to enter at any level. Uh, and for a number of reasons, just like they talked about the expensive, uh, recruiting, uh, the uh, competition, uh, but in the sports world, it's a very finite uh, job uh, pool. There are very few jobs. If you look at the number of jobs at non-player jobs in professional sports, it may be four or 5,000 people as compared to four or 5,000 people that are working in the business school at Wash U or at, at some sort of very small pool. Two, it is a very uh, glamorous sort of profession. So people get, if they're able to break in, they don't leave. So it's a low turnover position. And, and three, there's a lot of nepotism. Uh, you know, there are people who know somebody and, you know, they get hired or it's an owner who hires his kid or it's a family member. Everybody's got a friend that wants to be in a sports profession. So it's a very tough, very tough uh, field to break into. But like any field, sports agency, lawyers, uh, Phil's, Phil's profession representing a, a big agency, it's a sales job. You have to have clients. So we are all, I mean, even as a lawyer now, and one of the things I, I've learned more in private practice is I tried, came to Thompson Coburn and tried to start a, a, you know, sort of build our sports practice, is that we're always selling. We're always trying to get clients to come into the door to, and show them what we can do to help them. So those are kind of the things that are, are, are really important. And Darren, I reading your bio this morning, I saw that you had a hand in some of the legislation that came out on name, image, and likeness in the state of Florida. What potential role lawyers and agents could play 
in helping athletes navigate and monetize their name, image, and likeness. In terms of what lawyers and agents will be able to do, so let's talk about Florida, which again, I helped draft the, the legislation, which right now will be the first uh, to go into effect as of July 1 of this year. There are two other proposals uh, sitting on respective governor's desks that would be in Mississippi and Georgia to actually have the same effective date of July 1. But with regard specifically to Florida's legislation and, and law and, and the other five states that have passed legislation and had them signed into law, but with later effective dates, they all include provisions that would allow agents to sign players while they still retain student athlete eligibility. However, the agents will have to be licensed within the respective states. So for instance, in the state of Florida, the Department of um, Business and Professional Regulations, the DBPR, regulates agents. You have to be licensed as an athlete agent within the state. Go get your background check with your fingerprints taken, pay a, a, an annual fee, and effectively be licensed. There's no test. There used to be many years ago. The state got rid of it. And I'm not aware of any state that currently has a test while the players associations do require it. Um, at that point in time, as of July 1, if you're licensed as an athlete agent in the state of Florida, you will be able to sign an agency contract with a player. However, that agency contract must be specific to marketing only. It cannot be like in Harold's world, he signs what's called an SRA, a standard representation agreement with a player to represent that player with regard to contracts with NFL teams. The contract that he would sign with a player in the state of Florida while that player still has eligibility would not be an SRA. That would actually be a violation of Florida's law. So it would specifically have to be just on marketing on a marketing basis alone. And it would still have to include what I'm sure Harold is familiar with the standard language and the various athlete agent laws with the all caps, you know, you're potentially uh, avoiding your student athlete eligibility if you accept any sort of benefits and so on and so forth. Here we are, April 6th, not far away from July 1, and there's still a lot that can happen in the meantime. The NCA can change its own rules that prohibit uh, name, image, and likeness opportunities for athletes. The federal government can pass any one of six pending proposals right now, or even establish a new one between now and then, although that may seem unlikely because of the short time span. Um, and certainly more states could pass legislation. I mentioned Georgia and Mississippi that have bills in front of their respective governors. We've even seen California, which was the first state to pass legislation, consider moving up their effective date. So it's something to, to certainly follow. Bill, is this an area that Octagon is, is looking to get into in terms of you're trying to help some of these college athletes manage their brands. You've done a wonderful job managing so many brands that it would seem like there is that a potential for a fit, but I'm just curious if you've had internal discussions on this. I think for, for all of us in the industry, it's a very individual situation. There are uh, just a few percentage wise athletes who become national brands or have the opportunity to become that. Um, there are many more that become local brands or have the opportunity for that. And I would encourage all of those athletes who are more local brands to find somebody in their communities. It really is a business of connecting, organizing, arranging, making sure that these athletes aren't taken advantage of and they have a few opportunities to help them earn the income that a member of the band or a member of the art community at a school could, could also get. So we have our eyes on it, but I would not think that it would become um, a, a big business for anyone very quickly. 